So when we talk about impulse and momentum, we have to be very, very careful here because impulse is J, but it is not equal to P. Impulse is not equal to momentum. Impulse is equal to change in momentum. So what is this term impulse? What is this thing J? J or impulse is defined as the average force or the average net force times time and that's equal to a change in momentum. So that's going to be m delta v. It's going to give us how much that velocity changes. So what we can think of impulse as is a push on an object for a given time and that's how much its momentum changes. Now we know that a force pushed on an object, a net force, will make it accelerate. Now we're defining it more distinctly. We're saying how long that net force is applied for will give us exactly how much the momentum changes. Now the units for this are obviously force newtons times seconds, so newton seconds. And for uh, change of momentum, it's kilograms times meters per second. Well, how can two things that are equal have different units? Well, these units are actually the same. So if we look at this, we can say that a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Multiplying that by a second, the second squares cancels with the seconds and we're left with kilogram meters per second. So they are the same. Now, it's important that we pay attention to this idea that impulse is a vector because you push on things in a direction. So the direction that you push on them times time is going to be the direction of the change in momentum. So because velocity is a vector, we have to pay attention to this change as final minus initial. So finally, just going over this again, when we solve these problems, the best thing to do is to write this out, J equals delta P, and then rewriting it as FT equals M delta V. Now, because impulse is equal to change of momentum, we can also say that change of momentum is equal to impulse. So we could say that delta P is equal to FT. That's true. And we can also say that J is equal to M delta V. This is extremely useful to know. And this is the idea that we can use a graph to determine the impulse or change in momentum. So we know that if we have a graph of anything and we have a value Y and a value X, that Y times X, that's finding the area of this rectangle right here. So if we have a graph of force and time, then F times T is M delta V. So we can say that the area is equal to the impulse or the change in momentum. So what if we have an object that has a changing force? Remember that this formula is really the average force. So we can either find the area because the area is equal to J or delta P, but because the force is uniformly increasing, we could find the average force, which would be halfway up this graph, and multiply that by the time. That would be equal to the area of this triangle. So let's do a problem. One of the things that they like to do to make these problems tricky is to ask you for the change of momentum but not give you m and delta v. We know that that's equal to m and delta v but the trick is they want to see if you understand that delta p is equal to ft. So they'll give you a problem like this. A person pushes on a block with 100 newtons of constant force for five seconds. And the question is, find the change in momentum. Well, we know that impulse is equal to change in momentum. So we can just say change in momentum is force times time, or 100 times 5. That gives us a change in momentum of 500 newton seconds. Here's the opposite version of this question. And in this one, we have a 0.15 kilogram baseball 
and it's thrown from rest to 20 meters per second, and the question is find the impulse. So we might get tricked into thinking that we would do this as j equals ft, but they gave us m and delta v. So we know that j is equal to delta p, so j has to be equal to m delta v. They gave us the mass of the baseball, and we know it goes from 0 to 20, so that's a change of 20, and we just multiply to get the 3 kilogram meters per second. Because impulse and change of momentum are vectors, we have to be very careful about direction, especially when we deal with bouncing objects. So let's take a look at an example such as a ball that's thrown at a wall, it hits the wall, and it bounces back at 2 meters per second. So its initial velocity, vi, is 5, and its final velocity is what? Negative 2. So the question is, find the impulse. Well, they gave us m, and we can calculate delta v. So we're actually going to find j by doing m delta v. So we have j equals delta p, and we have j equals m delta v. But let's be very careful about finding our change in velocity. So our change in velocity is defined as final minus initial. So our final is minus 2 minus a positive 5. That gives us a change of minus 7. So when we put this into the formula, the half kilogram ball times negative 7, that gives us a value of negative 3.5 kilogram meters per second. Well, what does this negative mean? It means that the impulse of the wall was applied to the left. So let's just look at this idea again. If we drop a ball, it hits the floor and it bounces up, what's the change in velocity? It's not zero. It went down initially at five. It had to slow down, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Then it had to speed up, zero, one, two, three, four, five. So what's the change in velocity? The change in velocity is 10. Whereas here, if the ball falls down, let's say it's a, a lump of clay, that's typically how they ask these questions. The ball falls down, hits the floor and just sticks to the floor, it went from 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. So our change in velocity in this case would be 5. Um, I'm doing the magnitude, not the direction. So which one has the greater change in momentum? The one that has the greater change in velocity. Why do cars have airbags or why do cars have bumpers that compress when they crash into something? Or why do cars crumple up? The original cars would actually not crumple. They, their bumpers were made out of steel, and the cars would stop very quickly. So what's the purpose of all of this, of airbags, bumpers, and crumple zones? Well, the purpose is this. When you get in an accident, you can't change the mass of the person that's in the car. And if you crash, let's say you're going 20 meters per second and you crash into a tree or something like that, you stop, your change in velocity is going to be minus 20. So this is fixed. So if you don't want to get hurt, you only have one thing left to change, and that's the time of impact. So it may seem strange, but to survive a crash, you want to increase the time of the crash. So what can you do to increase that time? Well, the airbag lets you come to rest slower. It builds in time. Also, the bumper scrunching up or the crumple zone scrunching up. All of those increase the time of the collision. So if this is the same and the time of the collision goes up, then the other thing that has to change is the force. The force goes down. So you get more time but less force, so that means that your body ends up experiencing less force so you survive or you experience less pain in that situation. 
But what happens if we have a situation where the time is different and the force is the same? So cannons shoot cannonballs, but the force on the cannonball is fixed. That's due to the gunpowder expanding. So F is the same in both cases, but in the longer cannon, the cannonball is in the cannon for longer. Well, if the cannonballs have the same mass and the impulse is greater for the long cannon, that ends up producing a greater change in velocity. So short cannons do not shoot as fast as long cannons. So let's take what we've learned and apply this in an actual problem and put some numbers in. So let's say we have a car and the car slows down from 20 to 4 meters per second in a time of 15 seconds. Well, what would do that? Well, it would be the brakes of the car. The brakes of the car would push on the tires, the tires would push on the road, and the road would push on the car. So it's the friction between the road and the car. So we're looking for the force that the brakes are applying to make this happen. So what are we looking for? Well, in this case, they gave us mass. They gave us the time. And the change in velocity, we have to be careful of this, the change in velocity is going to be final minus initial. So that change in velocity is going to be final, 4 meters per second, minus the initial, 20 meters per second. So our change in velocity is minus 16 meters per second. And it said, what is the average force applied by the brake? So we're looking for F. So we can write out our formula and put in F as our unknown and 15 seconds for our time, 1200 for our mass, and our change in velocity of negative 16 meters per second. And if we do the math on that, we get an average force of friction, our net force in this case, as minus 1280 newtons. Now, what does this minus sign mean? It means that the force of friction acting on the car is to the left. Now, we say the brakes, but it's actually the friction of the road pushing on the car. In this one, we have a tennis ball hit by a racket. And they give us the average force exerted by the racket, that's 500 newtons, and they tell us how long the ball is in contact with the racket. So that would be the time, 0 0.006 seconds. And they're looking for the change in velocity. So let's write down what we got. 0 0.05 kilograms. The force is 500 newtons. And the ball is in contact for 0 0.006 seconds and we're looking for delta V. So again, we can write J equals delta P, and we can say FT equals M delta V. We have 500 newtons times 0 0.006 seconds, and that's gonna be equal to a mass of 0 0.05 kilograms times a change in velocity, which is unknown. So when we do the math on that, we end up with a positive 60 meters per second. If the ball approached the racket at 20 meters per second, what velocity did it leave the racket? So we know that the change in velocity was 60. So the question is, if it comes in at 20, what speed does it leave at? VF is question mark. I already wrote the answer there. So we have change in velocity is equal to VF minus VI, and our change is 60 meters per second. Our final velocity is unknown, and we have a minus, a minus 20 meters per second. So we have to be careful because we're saying to the left is negative, so that 20 is negative. And we get a plus 40, we subtract that, uh, sorry, plus 20, we subtract that to the other side, which gives us a plus 40 meters per second. 